working here at Sunset for 22 years, so I've been doing cremations uh, that long. I've been full-time in the cremation board since 2016. Uh, so, they were telling you about the paperwork and the importance of having everything correctly. Uh, because once the cremation process has started, we can't undo it. That's it. So we have to make absolutely certain that that is who every, all the paperwork and everybody says that. So we have a very uh, extensive check-in process. Now they, the office staff will check through the paperwork to make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. So once all that's done, the transfer team will bring the decedent here for a check-in. When they come into the office to check in, they'll go into the office and they'll be issued a cremation care ticket that has the name of the decedent, the birth date, uh, today's date, and the time that that decedent's come in, and deceased name, all that information. And then they'll be issued the identity disc. It's a steel, stainless steel disc that has the cremation number engraved upon it. And they'll bring that information over to us. The office will let us know that we have to check it. So we'll go over. And the first thing we do when we get the cremation care ticket is we'll look at what we call the head tag. So we need to know the way the body's positioned in the casket, which end is the head because we load every case feet first. So we have a tag that we call the head tag, and that indicates which end is the head end of the deceit in the casket. And that head tag is computer printed, so there's no discrepancies with somebody's handwriting or anything like that. And it has the name and the birthday on it. And we compare that head tag to that cremation care ticket, letter for letter. If it is off by one letter, that case will be rejected, period. There's no Great right here, it's black and white. It's, yes? Uh, what difference does it make? Head first, feet first? Is it like a technical thing? Or? Uh, I, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, but it is. It's an operational thing, and you'll be able to observe that uh, when we go into the crematory. So, letter for letter, birth date has to match, number for number. Also, on the head tag, we have a, a spot that says no pacemakers, and that has to be initial. They can't put removed. I mean, they can. They can write whatever they want there. But if it's not initial, we'll reject that. Pacemaker. They used to just be pacemakers that were they're implanted medical devices that have a battery. Now there's a lot of other. There's pain pumps and insulin pumps and there's a lot of stuff that has batteries. Batteries explode in the retort. <coughs> and you can hear it. It makes it pop. And the fact that you can hear it through one foot thick refractory walls with 85 decibels of machine blower going. It's pretty <coughs> substantial pop. Least of all, it damages the machine. Worst case is if an operator is observing the case at that time. They could be severely injured or killed by shrapnel. Uh, so no pacemakers, no anything with a battery. You want to take the next step? This is Savannah. <laughs> She's a crematory operator, too. Um, Hi, I'm Savannah. I've been a crematory operator for two years, about two years. Um, yeah, so um, after the check-in process, we make sure everything's correct, and when everything is correct, um, when we have an open machine, then we can get ready to load the decedent into the machine. Um, usually we have to let the machine get up to a certain temperature. Um, sometimes 800 degrees for certain machines, for other machines it's 1100 degrees, because if it's too cold when you load that decedent, there's too much smoke that emits and it can create too much smoke out of the stack and it's just not good for when people see it out in the road and like they call the fire department when they see too much smoke. So um, we have to let it get up like pretty hot in there before we load up a decedent. Um, and so, and then once it hits that temperature, then we have a lift that we can show you once we get into the crematory um, that we raise up the decedent. And we have a roller also that we help, that helps us load us the decedent inside the machine. So then we place the roller inside the machine on the lift. And then the, the lift has rollers on it as well. 
So then, once it gets up to temperature, open the door and then gently roll the decedent into the machine, close the door, and then it takes over from there. And at, at a certain point, the cremation burner comes on. And why we load the feet first and the head goes in uh, second is because the cremation burner is on the torso part because the torso has more fat content and muscle content, so it has to burn quicker because otherwise, if it's not under the cremation burner, then it doesn't burn as fast or as quickly and we can't load other decedents in a good amount of time. So, And usually we cremate nine decedents a day, so it takes about one and a half to two hours each, depending on each decedent and how heavy they are. Um, and then once the decedent is done, all the casket is burned down and all everything else is burned down, um, but only the bones are left. Only the bones are left, um, and that's when you can tell it's all done. Um, and then when they're done, we cool down the machine, so we set the machine to blow down once we find out it's definitely ready. So once it's cooled down to about 600 degrees, we rake it out, and then we can get ready for another decedent to get loaded. Uh, in terms of how much, uh, these are natural gas units? These, these are natural gas units. Now, mm -hmm. uh, Sunset Memorial Park, we have four crematory retorts. Uh, they're called retorts because they have a hot hearth. And the hot hearth is a hollow chamber underneath the hearth where the decedent lays and the cremation process. So any emissions and heat that are generated by the decedent flow through that chamber underneath the heart, so it's, so it's heated from both sides. That's to help accelerate the, the cremation process and conserve energy uh, before it goes out through the stack. The other type of uh, cremator is called an inline, and an inline is a cold heart machine. So the refractory is just built in from the walls in the bottom, and the aft chamber is in the back, and so everything circulates through. So when we preheat a machine, uh, minimum temperature 800 degrees, before you put uh, uh, any kind of flame on the case. Uh, most machines have a low fire and a high fire. The low fire is to reach the container and then the chest cavity, and then the high fire comes on to help accelerate the cremation process. Part way through, uh, and we can go over this in here. In fact, I don't know, we can do that. It'll be easier to understand if you see it. Okay. Um, you all want to. schedule a witnessing cremation where you can come up and have your service here in the chapel and then directly have your loved one brought in here, load it into the retort, and given the opportunity to actually start the process. That's the way to start the process. So, <clears throat> uh, the way the machine is set up, you have your afterburner, that's a primary burner. The machines run at about 1,650 degrees off to cremate a deceit. So the afterburner, it preheats the machine, it helps regulate the temperature, and it takes care of particulates. Okay, you have a low fire cremation, I was telling you about, that one's to breach the container on the chest cavity. So that opens up, and then it will go up to the cremation fire, the high fire. There's throat air, and the throat air starts at the beginning of the case, because if you look at it kind of scientifically, anything we put in the retort is fuel, is to burn, okay? And when you first load it up, that's a lot of fuel. That fuel can burn too fast, too much heat, and overwhelm the machine. And that puts the machine at risk, it puts the facility at risk, it puts us at risk. So the throat air is there to evacuate the initial heat that is generated from the start of the cremation so it doesn't accumulate too much heat. Uh, that air will shut off when the fat and muscle is burned down and you're down into more of the, the internal organs which are less combustible. Uh, to retain some of that heat and help accelerate the later stage of cremation. The hearth air 
uh, comes on late stage when it's down to that. So it's kind of like going on the embers of a campfire. The embers are down, you add oxygen, it accelerates that combustion. So cremation uh, and a coal machine, because it's all the machines are refractory brick, it's this brick, and I like to explain it like a, a sponge. If you're using a sponge, it soaks up a lot of water, after a while it gets saturated, and it won't soak up any more water. Just kind of smear it all around until you bring it up. The brick is like that too. It will absorb the heat during the cremation process. But subsequent cremations, that brick can become saturated with heat. Whatever you put in there is still going to generate heat, and it has to go somewhere. If the machine can't evacuate enough through the stack, it will come out wherever it can. Yeah. And so you have to be very careful. Hmm, that's interesting. So, you, you get trained in all of this. Um, I've been doing it a long time. Yeah. I've had several trainings. Uh, all of cremate, uh, French's operators are Canis certified cremation uh, specialists. So, and and uh, Sunset's crematories probably have combined with some of the others that we've had doing cremation. No, it's like I don't know, 60 years of cremation experience mm -hmm. altogether. So. And you have a pet as well as human. We do pets, and yeah, there's a picture of me next to the pet machine on your website. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, you've done this tour before. I'm sorry? And animals also? So we've, we've done some livestock with the pets. Um, goats, uh, sheep, pigs that people have had as pets. Uh, not much bigger than that. We're not capable of doing uh, larger livestock, horses or or cows or anything like that. We've done a few alpacas, um, mm -hmm. but large animals, you need a large machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So witness cremation, is there like a glass there? Or no, so with a witness cremation, after you've had your service or your visitation or anything, uh, we'll open up the doors, we'll bring the deceased in the casket in, onto the lift, uh, we'll raise the lift as Savannah had said, up to here, we keep rollers under there. It's a cardboard roller that goes with the decedent, but it's consumed during the cremation. We'll open the door, and it's quite like this. Load the decedent in, close the door, and then when the family's allowed to start the process, they can start it. So what they we, witness the start. They the witness the start. They don't witness the Well, yeah. no, because the whole cremation, you can't see the fire. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not safe to have the machine open when the fire first comes on. Uh, so they're allowed to stay until the machine reaches 750 degrees. That gives time for them to exit. You notice these doors are, are solid wood, they're fire doors. Fire doors. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to put the fire on the case uh, at 800 degrees. And so at 750, we ask the family if they could return to the chapel, you can stay in there. You know, or the, that's the end of the, the witnessing. We, we close the doors and that's when we start fire on the case. Some uh, religious beliefs, uh, the family wants to be as involved as they can uh, to do that. Some people just want to make sure that that is their loved one prior to going into the retort. Um, there can be many reasons. So we try to be as accommodating as we can. Is it loud? Like if you're, if you're in there while this is running? So it's, it's right now it's not loud because we have it walled up. Um, but they run about 85, 90 decibels, so they can be very loud. You probably saw me earlier with my big red headphones on. Uh, those are sound. Do you have to wear any other protective? We, we will wear masks during processing. Uh, we will wear eye protection uh, when raking, and we do have uh, welder's gloves and different gloves, so that, because uh, uh, it gets pretty hot. Yeah, yeah, 600 degrees is still pretty hot. So, so there's a lot of energy that's spent in Absolutely. That All I kept on thinking was cremation was like the best environmental thing. Actually, cremation is more environmentally green than ground burial. Yeah, she, she did a whole presentation she did. on it. She did. Yes. Um, Interesting. Um, is it because of all the embalmers chemicals that are used? You oh, have that as well, options. the diesel fuel with usually the heavy equipment. Um, uh, the time involved, uh, yeah. We also have pollution control in our machines as well. Oh, that help, that filters the emissions. So, yeah. 
And, and Savannah telling us about smoker is a risk, but all our machines have been running today, except for this one. But down there, did you guys see any smoke? No. No. <laughs> no. Several, several cases of pests, so several through the machines, and then all the human machines were going. A little bit of smoke from one this morning. That's first one. A little bit. Is there any way we can with your paper? Huh? Is there any way we can? I, a PowerPoint. <laughs> I have a PowerPoint somewhere. But yeah. <laughs> yes, it would be interesting. We can see what I, we can do. I would make like that to, because it is yeah. believed otherwise. Right. I'm, yeah, from, but, I'm from Turkey. Okay. It is believed that this is the environmentally worst, worst solutions. Choice. Yeah. So I was just wondering. Yeah. I really didn't know. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have like. You know statistics and everything that I yeah. researched. It was extensive <laughs> research. I was, I was yeah. impressed because I didn't. I didn't believe that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it seems like a lot of energy that goes Absolutely. into mm -hmm. this. So it, it, that's what made me. So any any other questions about the cremation process? Well, let's talk about uh, you talked about raking and processing. So so yeah, I was going to get to that. Okay. Um, uh, anybody else any questions about? During the cremation, I was going to say you could mention how we have separate retorts for humans and pets that they're uh, never, separate separate yeah, buildings, separate, separate buildings. facilities that uh, we never commingle anything like that because even on the human the human crematory is in its own separate building. I won't allow anybody even on human crematory business to walk through the pet crematory because it's Why? kind of a shortcut because I don't want any kind of conflict of interest where somebody might think or come to that conclusion. We walk all the way around. Mm -hmm. Can people be, be cremated with their pets? No. No. Why? Because, because we, use this, we use the machine for multiple people mm -hmm. and most everybody else doesn't want to be cremated with your pet. pet. <laughs> because industry standard is that we recover, you get back 100% of recoverable remains. They put that qualifier in there. Because you do not get back 100% of remains. You get as much as we can get. You get a little bit of ash um, from, from the container. They, they don't want or somebody else's stuff. And you get a little bit of the refractory <laughs> material because it does slough off over time. Right we, we, okay. treat, we treat the, bis the, the pet business and the human business like two separate entities. Okay, so that's There's a complete yeah. separation. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what you can do sure. is you can have your pet cremated, you can be cremated, and then you can have your family, because we won't do that either, mm -hmm. mix them all up. Together, yeah. Any other professional hazards for you, apart from, like, uh, shrapnel of the battery? Um, long run? Burns. Burns. <laughs> uh, uh, mass, uh, we can have, you know, inhaling dust, because it is a very dusty environment. Oh, mm -hmm. That's true. Really um, you know, uh, uh, specific injury. You hurt your back. In some cases, are, are larger than others. Just manhandling them, moving them around. I mean, we we utilize the equipment, but uh, a lot of the same. It's just a mask, not any kind of respirator. We, we use a dust that. mask for the most part. Uh, we don't usually use full respirators. Um, it's not very practical in there with the heat because if you're fully sealed up like that, there's no amount of defog is going to work. You're not going to see anything. And even the ones that like have the batteries attached to them. That's a, like that. a, extensive, and and PPE is is designed to be like everything that's engineered past. Then PPE is like this is we couldn't do anything more. So this is this is what you got. So mm -hmm. but yeah, a full big bird suit with a, a respirator. Yeah, and then they wouldn't survive in the heat, or we wouldn't survive in them in the yeah, heat. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, we we use swamp coolers because refrigerated air would make sense. But where we're at, this area right here is refrigerated air, but we have that walled off, and this is for witnessing, you know. Right. And you can still feel it's getting warm in here, not just with us, but we ran the machine yesterday, and so it, it just makes a lot of heat. Um, when you're doing a little old grandmother versus a 300 pound linebacker, uh, what's the difference in the energy usage? So it depends on the heat of the machine. That's a good question. So, the machine first thing in the morning is what's considered a cold machine. And somebody who's very small without a lot of fat content is loaded in there. The machine has to do more work. It can take longer because there's not as much natural fuel. Okay. Right. 
Um, and hot machining, that person will go very quickly with an hour and a half. You know, most average cremation takes about two, two and a half hours. So at 350 pounds, there's a cutoff, which is considered industry, an obese case. And an obese case, we have to run very carefully because human fat cremates 16 times hotter than kerosene. Mm -hmm. It burns. That's, that's mm -hmm. fat. Uh, that does that. So if you have somebody who's over 350 pounds, like I said before, that's all fuel getting loaded. Yeah. If you try and cremate that, like an average case, where the fire is constantly on, it will overwhelm your machine. So you have to do it very carefully, very slowly. Somebody 350 pounds or heavier is likely going to take seven, eight hours to cremate I'm because expensive. of the amount of fuel. We have to do it really slow and take our time to do it safely. Did you ask if it costs more? more? It, does it cost do you charge more? more? Uh, we do. Yeah. There's an a, a, a increased rate for a, an oversized case. Or a different machine or the same one? So but more skill? Well, I'm sorry? Do you use a different machine for obese people? No, no. our machines can, that's, we got supers. It's French has, I mean, okay. I, one of the reasons I like working here is because we have the most advanced kind of cremation operation set up in the state. Um, in an obese case in the state, yeah, yeah in New Mexico. Uh, uh, another thing with an obese case, typically we'll load them head first because that puts the bulk of the mass away from the burn. So at the end of the cremation cycle, the remains are allowed to cool until we can safely remove them. And then we have a, use a rake and a brush and we push them to the back. We have the rear clean out. We'll bring them out. We'll put them in a cooling pan. And then in the cooling pan, once they're cool, We'll place them in, they call it a pulverizer, we like to call it a processor because it sounds a little bit nicer. <laughs> so because what you have left is a little bit of refractory dust, a little bit of ash, and the skeleton. Completely dehydrated. So it's very brittle, but it's kind of hard. You can't fit all that into a urn, so you want to break it down. And so we break it down and so the cremated remains kind of a, a white ivory color, look kind of like dust. Somebody told me fish crap. So uh, sometimes that consistency, you can have them processed even more. In fact, our production facility, we have a metal sifting processor that uses a chain flat. And the consistency that we get from that is much better than that we get from the blades. But this one is so we don't have to carry somebody unprocessed all the way down the hill. Yeah. So uh, and once they're processed, they're, they're boxed and tagged and labeled and returned to the office to be burned up. I understand in Japan uh, there's a tradition of having the family pick out like longer bones with so chopsticks. Di different cultures have different kind of traditions. We do accommodate, we, we work with the Buddhist temple uh, through our Lomas French location and they do what they like to call a relic search. They have to ask for it uh, because if, if it's offered people will be like, yeah, I want to do that. And then when they come in they'll be like, okay, what do I do? It's like, yeah, honest. We're giving you an opportunity. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to look for. So a lot of times they wish to observe the decedent in the machine undisturbed. So when I say undisturbed, usually an hour into the cremation process, an hour and a half, we'll go and take a look to see where what stage it's at. Because the burner is offset, sometimes we'll reposition the remains underneath the burner to help accelerate the cremation process. Uh, a lot of times with the relic search, they want the remains undisturbed so that they can look and see them in the retort. Then we escort them into the chapel, then we remove the remains from the machine. We don't allow that to be observed. So then we have the remains, we put them in a big cooling tray, and they're usually pretty cool by then. And the family, uh, or the lama that's with them, will look for relics. I don't know the specific purpose of that, but they will take these relics and place them off to the side, and then we'll close the doors again, and then we'll process. And then we'll return the remains, and sometimes they'll add the relics back. What do they the consider to be relics? I don't know. Re yeah. Huh. Just interesting. Wow. They tell them about the metal disc, how it travels along with. So the the metal ID disc we place in the machine with the decedent, so you can see this paperwork up here. This is the cremation care ticket, and then the tracking sheet. The cremation or the the tracking disc is placed just in the front lip of the retort in the machine with the decedent 
is there during the entire cremation and it's removed with that deceit. And it goes back usually on the zip tie on the back. So there's that identification. And then during after processing, the cremation care ticket goes in the bag of remains. So, and, and hopefully it stays here when the remains are earned up. We've had police bring in recovered cremated remains, you know, it's like stolen property and stuff, and want to try and identify who that is. Wow. And if they have that ticket in there, that we know who that is. Wow. Mm -hmm. Or just the desk. If we just see the desk and it's from us, it's from us. we're able to figure out who it who is. It was. But sometimes we've gotten <clears throat> remains from other funeral homes because people just think, oh, we'll just bring it to a cemetery. And so we've been able to like say, oh, this is from Daniels or whatever. And they're able to track it based on the way they do their tracking system. Mm -hmm. So do um, they have a disc or you're able to know because of how the cremains are? It's usually made. because of the desk. The desk. Yeah. And so like our desk has the cremation number on it and then it has French funerals and then it has something else on there. Um, that's, oh, our, that's phone, our phone Oh, number. and our phone number. Our phone number, number. yeah. Oh. So, but it has the cremation number. So like we, like if we saw 2023 dash 0501, we would know that, oh, okay, that was our 501 cremation of the year, and we could go to our logs and track everything. And we have more than one way of tracking things. We we kind of double, triple up things when it comes to this kind of stuff, because like, for example, if we just went off of the computer system and the computers weren't working or whatever, we, okay. there's other ways of finding out things. So uh, that's one really good thing about our cemetery is we we cross our T's and dot our I's and if, hey, the commuters don't work, no problem. We have books. We have, so we have a lot of paper at the cemetery. <laughs> yeah. So. We still keep paper logs. Mm -hmm. You do. Yes. yes. And they've saved us. They've saved us a lot. I mean, you know, like, really. We had a computer, major computer issue that shut us down for uh, six weeks. Six weeks. Uh, two years, well, we were cyber attacked, but. And the Two years ago. Our cemetery and all of our processes were able to continue forward. Uh, it was a frustration and it, it slowed us down, but we didn't. We didn't but because of our backups and our right. old, our old school ways, it was like it, it didn't really affect us. I mean, it affected us because we didn't have a computer, but right. we were still able to work. Wow. So, wow. So, one thing that uh, Dave, we did mention is. Um, you guys have talked a little, asked some very good questions about efficiencies and environmental concerns. Um, these retorts are highly um, regulated by the city of Albuquerque. Um, in, in fact, we, we really can't add any more at this point. Uh, the city will not permit us further. We, we're looking at just replacements. We replace them with newer, more efficient units, and even that can take three to four years to do a single replacement. Um, uh, we're, we're in the process of one. I've been here almost three years and we're just now looking at an installation date for one that was started just before I got here. So that was about a three year permitting process. Um, and these, th these retorts are heavily maintenance and Dave leads the charge on that. And so they're regularly inspected. They're very, we keep them as efficient as possible. And, and, and because of Dave and his team's done, you know, dedication and hard work there, you'll, you'll, never, you'll very rarely see any you know smoke coming out of our stacks and things like that. You you see those things in the news with other crematories and when if if and it does happen occasionally, but when it does, I mean we're all running around and we're calling Dave and we're like you, you, something needs to be adjusted. We um, we have self-reported you know. to the city on mm -hmm. on smoke violations. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it's 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 and everybody has issues that does not have that. So yeah. so we do we can't do that. Of course, I'm, I'm really pleased to say that when the city. You know, and the, when the city is training or the state is training someone, that, a new compliance officer, that's going to go around and check compliance and regulate, you know, regu do regulations and all the retorts. They typically bring that a new employee here first, and they show them our operation first. Oh wow! So that's a compliment. It is. I I remember a few years ago um, there was a study about uh, emissions of mercury from fillings in oh. people who are cremated. 
Uh, can you update on the status of that? That's really, that's a little more granular than I could involve. In okay. Patient. Do you have any information on that? I, I really don't. Uh, and, I mean, it's going to vary from deceit to deceit, and it's not something that we track. Um, so it's it's not something that we're we're aware of that we can control. We know it's it is a thing. Uh, so so the mercury does still get uh, emitted. It's, it's yeah. uh, mercury among other things yeah. uh, that still get in there um, that that are released during the cremation process. Yeah. yeah. And even with all of that, it's still more green than. We want to see that study. <laughs> yes. 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 Please <laughs> let us know. Well, from, what a, about our, from a probability standpoint, we want it to be green. We want to use as few, few natural resources as we have to. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, we, that's important. It's important to us. So. so for our people on Zoom or on YouTube, I must sign off now because we're not going to show you the decedent in the retort, but the people who are here get to see that person. So thank you for an excellent tour. We're looking forward to the door opening. Mm -hmm.